Welcome to Simon's Time Adventure Part 3. At the end of Part 2, you had just finished exploring the Lascaux Caves in ancient France. Here comes Simon. Oh wow! That did make me feel a little bit wibbly wobbly, Chloe. For a few seconds there, the whole world was spinning around us. Like we were in the middle of a tornado. Now it's stopped, everything looks completely different. And I mean, different with a capital D. Mm. Oh man, I hope you like sand. Because we're in the middle of the desert, for sure. The air is still quite cool. Probably because the sun hasn't quite come up over the horizon yet. And we're also standing in another valley. But this is nothing like the French Valley we were in a minute ago. There's no plants or animals here. Just sand and piles of rocks and then more rocks and more sand. We're surrounded by really tall cliffs and we are near the bottom of one of them. Oh, this reminds me a lot of our Mars adventure when we had a little chat with Curiosity, the rover. This can't be Mars though, because Mars doesn't have any buildings on it. And about 10 steps away from us, there's a tiny little hut made of limestone and mud. There's also quite a few tracks winding their way through the middle of the valley. One of them goes right past us, up the hill a bit, and it stops at what looks like a cave entrance. This is all starting to make sense to me now. And that absolutely awesome music I'm grieving to is a perfect clue. Uh, Chloe, have we jumped forward in time so that now we're only about three and a half thousand years in the past instead of 17,000 years? Yes. Are we in ancient Egypt? Yes. OK, OK, I know what you're thinking. If we're in ancient Egypt, where are the pyramids? Yeah! If we're where I think we are, those pyramids are at least 700 kilometres away. Oh! I reckon this is going to be much more interesting. Chloe, are we in the Valley of the Kings? Yes, Simon. This is the Valley of the Kings, located in southern Egypt, in the year 1324 BCE. I knew it! This whole valley is full of kings, all right. The only problem is, they're all dead. Yep, these cliffs are chock-a-block full of fantastically famous pharaohs, all sealed away in their tombs deep in the mountainside completely hidden from the outside world. Hmm. Those guys were playing the ultimate game of hide and seek. Except, without the seek bit, they didn't want anyone looking for them. <whistles> Remember those enormous pyramids that I said are 700 kilometres away? The pharaohs used to get buried inside those pyramids. The only problem was, Everybody knew where they were. And everybody also knew that the pharaoh's tombs were overflowing with more gold and jewels than you could shake a stick at. So, who do you think turned up to the pharaoh's jewellery party even though they weren't invited? <laughs> yep, you guessed it. The tomb raiders. The grave robbers, the pyramid pirates. They broke into almost every pyramid and took off with the gold. They even stole the pharaohs themselves. Yep, they even took the mummies out of the coffins. Dead men tell no tales. Eventually, someone really clever must have said, I know, if we put the tombs inside a mountain in the middle of the desert, no one will ever find them. And that's why they're buried here, in the Valley of the Kings, trying to hide from the robbers. Oh! Chloe, 
Is there anyone in that little hut? No, Simon. There is no one in the hut. It is used by the workers who build the tombs for the pharaohs. They will be arriving here to commence work in approximately 45 minutes. Perfect! That gives us plenty of time to check it out. Sometimes these little huts had something that's totally OG on the wall that faces south. OK, so it's not this wall. It's the one all the way around the other side. Here we are. And good golly, Miss Molly. There it is. Right where I was hoping it would be. Can you see in your imagination? Right in front of us on the wall is a flat piece of yellow limestone. It's shaped like a semicircle, about the same size as your dinner plate if you cut it in half. And the flat edge is on the top and the curved edge is underneath. It has a little wooden stick poking out of the hole in the top centre. But here's the best bit. Someone has drawn a semicircle on it with black ink. They've also drawn 11 more lines, starting from the centre stick, going out to the edge of the semicircle. If you didn't know what this was, you might think it's instructions for how to cut half of a pizza into 12 pieces. But it's not. We're looking at the oldest, most original sundial in the world. Cool. Like three and a half thousand years old. Wow. I knew it had to be on this wall because Egypt is in the northern hemisphere. And that means the south wall gets the most sunlight during the day. Oh. When the sun shines on that little stick at the top, it casts a shadow onto the lines underneath. And that would tell these workers if it was lunchtime yet, or maybe time to pack up for the day. And that also tells us that they divided the day up into 12 hours. Score one for the ancient Egyptians, inventors, inventors of, of the, the sundial. sundial. Let me tell you something not many people know about sundials. There are three of them on Mars right now. I'm serious. There's a sundial on all three of the Mars rovers. Really? That's Curiosity, Opportunity and Spirit. The base of those little sundials are a very special colour. That helps the operators back on Earth make sure the cameras on the rovers are recording colours correctly. Shadow on the dial also helps them to check the rovers are going in the right direction. Impressive. Remember I said this desert reminds me of Mars? Well, I would have to call that an out-of-this-world crazy coincidence. We're standing in the desert looking at one of the first sundials ever invented and right this very second there are three of them driving around in a desert that looks just like this one over 200 million kilometres away on a completely different planet. That is spooky, man. Very spooky. Do you know what's the best thing to take with you into a desert? A first aid kit. <laughs> and what's brown and hairy lives in the desert, has four legs, two humps and is full of cement. A camel I put in the cement just to make it harder. <laughs> oh, it's easy for camels to hide out here in the desert, you know. They just camouflage themselves. <laughs> oh, Chloe, you know that cave entrance above us where the path stops? Well, that's not really a cave entrance, is it? You are correct, Simon. It is not a cave entrance. It is the entrance to the tomb of the recently deceased pharaoh, Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun? Holy superstar, Batman! That guy is the most famous pharaoh like ever. No worries. Does that mean 
He's actually in there? Yes, Simon. The mummy of Tutankhamun is in there. Is the tomb open? Yes, it is still open. Oh, come on! While we're here, this is our chance to check out the coolest tomb on the whole planet. It's about 20 steps away up the side of the cliff, but it's not too steep. The hardest bit is keeping your balance in this desert sand because it's so soft. Every time you take a step, you sink into it. <sighs> oh, yeah, I forgot to check the new clue on our tickets. It says, be on the lookout for a 28 million year old insect from outer space that is believed to have magical powers. Ooh. You may also find a weapon manufactured from extraterrestrial material. Extraterrestrial? That's not what I expected to hear when we're just about to go into an ancient Egyptian tomb. How excellent! Let me know if you see any really old bugs from space carrying a laser. Righto, we're at the entrance. But Chloe, did I hear you say before that the workers were coming back soon? The tomb workers will be here in approximately 35 minutes to commence sealing off all the interior doorways in the tomb and also this entrance. Oh, we better get a move on. We need to be gone before they show up. I'm 100% into checking out this tomb, but I don't want to be accidentally sealed in there. Looks like there's some steps leading down, but that's all I can make out. It's darker than the inside of Batman's wardrobe down there. Simon, there were no lights in these tombs. The workers would bring candles or hand-held lamps with them. Allow me to raise the level of the ambient illumination to a safe level for you. Oh, nice one, Chloe. Perfecto. I thought there was only a couple of stone steps, but there's at least 12. Okie dokie, let's boogie on down these steps and see what we can see. Oh, they're quite steep, so you can think about resting your hand against the wall if you like, for balance. They feel a bit rough, don't they? They've been plastered over, but they're not super smooth. Can you feel how the air is getting cooler and cooler the further down we go? Once they seal it off, the temperature in here will stay around 18 degrees Celsius for thousands of years. Oh, that's uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit for all my American friends. Thank you. You're welcome. You definitely won't need an air conditioner down here. Okay, we're at the bottom of the steps and we can just keep moving because there's a plain white corridor straight ahead of us and it slopes downwards a bit. This passageway is only 10 steps long and that seems a bit odd for a pharaoh's tomb. They're usually three times as long as this one. Something else doesn't feel right either. I know what it is. Those pharaohs were the exact opposite of the cave painters in our last adventure in France. If anything even looked like a wall, they draw pictures of themselves and their gods and themselves with their gods and their favourite animals. Can you see in your mind that these walls are completely blank? There isn't even a single hieroglyphic symbol or a drawing on them anywhere. Seriously, right? You can bet that all the other tombs in this valley have walls that are covered with pictures. Well, so far, I wouldn't say it feels like the tomb of the most famous pharaoh ever. Something tells me the whole thing was made in a bit of a hurry. Once again, Simon, you are absolutely correct. Your detective skills appear to be improving with every adventure. Oh, thanks, Chloe. According to the most recent archaeological research, this tomb was originally intended for someone else. When Tutankhamun died unexpectedly, this was the only one available at such short notice and had to be finished off very quickly. 
there was insufficient time for any of the pharaoh's royal artists to decorate the entrance to the tomb properly. Of course! When a pharaoh died, they had to be mummified ASAP and then popped straight into their royal tomb. It would have taken them oh, 70 days to turn Tutankhamun into a mummy. So that means they only had a couple of months to find a good spot in this valley and get it ready for him. They didn't have time to start a brand new one. So it looks like they just pinched one that was already started and used that instead. Mind you, the royal dudes who wrapped up the dead pharaohs were very good at their job. They had a sign over their door and it said, Satisfaction guaranteed or double your mummy back. <laughs> and what would you get if you crossed a yellow mummy with a green mummy? A golden mouldy? <laughs> Do you know why mummies never go on holiday? They're scared they might relax and unwind. <laughs> but how do mummies hide? They wear masking tape. <laughs> and what kind of coffee does a mummy drink? Decoffinated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, we're almost at the end of the corridor. That means we're seven metres lower than the top of the stairs. Oh, can you imagine being one of the workers who had to hollow this out? Remember, these aren't caves. They had to bring picks and shovels and baskets and actually dig into the side of these mountains by hand and then carry it all back outside up those steps. Wow. It could have taken them 10 years at least to build a tomb, but now, we could probably do it in a couple of weeks with bulldozers and excavators and power tools. Hmm. I hope you're ready for your first sneaky peek because we're at the open doorway to what I'll call the first room in the tomb. Come on, in we go. Oh, wowza, wowza. And triple wowzer. Flashback city, baby. It's definitely deja vu in here. This place reminds me of the spare room at my mum and dad's house where they stored all of their old junk. There's so much stuff in here, you can hardly move. The main difference is we didn't have any furniture made of gold and there seems to be quite a lot of that in here. You better tell your imagination to strap in because the only two words I can use to describe this room are totes weird, man. Hmm. The first wacky thing you'll never see anywhere else is over in the left-hand corner. It's three golden chariots. You heard that right. Three chariots. And they're gold-plated. Someone has pulled them apart and stacked the pieces along the wall because that's the only way they'd fit them into a tomb like this. Oh man, a gold chariot would have been their version of a gold-plated convertible sports car. Oh, wicked. Now straight ahead of us, against the long wall, there are three funeral beds. The mummy of Tutankhamun would have had a little lie down on each one of those as part of a ceremony to help get him to the afterlife. Hmm. The sides of these beds are different animal shapes. The one on the left is a hippopotamus, the middle one is a cow, and the one on the right is a lion. Just like the chariots, they are completely covered in gold. I'm going to need my sunglasses in a minute if things get any shinier in here. And don't bother trying to have a lie down on the beds though. There's no room. Every square centimetre on top and underneath them is covered with boxes and chests and statues and ornaments. 
I told you, it looks like my junk room at home. Except my old stuff wouldn't be worth a gazillion dollars. <sighs> Speaking of downright positively priceless, can you see in your imagination that under that first bed there's a very shiny chair? Ooh. That's Tutankhamun's royal throne. And what a shock! It's covered in gold too! Wow. I'm going to guess if he had a dog, it'd be a golden retriever. And his favourite bedtime story would be Goldilocks. Nice! Uh, do you know what's worth its weight in gold? Gold! <laughs> oh man, is it just me or is it gold in here? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tasted pure gold? Well, I have, and it's a bit crunchy. Uh, probably because it's made of 24 carrots. <laughs> I pulled a muscle when I was digging up some gold, and my doctor said, well, don't worry, Simon, it's just a minor injury. <laughs> now, in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were, no questions asked, the top dogs, the head honchos, the biggest cheeses, basically the most important peeps on the planet. Because they were the only ones who could speak directly to the gods. Uh -huh. When they died, they would go to a very hip and happening afterlife and become a god themselves. Ooh. Once they got there though, they still wanted to have all the cool stuff they had collected during their lifetime as a king. Even the toys they had when they were little. So don't try to tell an ancient Egyptian that you can't take it with you. They'd think you were nuts. And they even wanted to take their favourite snacks with them. That's why it smells a bit like the corner delicatessen in here. Mm. We are surrounded by more food and drink than you'd buy in your weekly groceries. All to feed the pharaoh's spirit, but not his tummy, on his trip to the afterlife. There's more than 100 baskets in here, overflowing with fruit and seeds and nuts and spices and bread. And have a look under the middle couch. Can you see that enormous pile of egg-shaped white wooden containers? There's 48 of them and they're all full of meat. Unbelievable. Sounds like Tutankhamun's spirit wanted to rustle up a ham sandwich on his way to the afterlife. <laughs> oh, excellent day. There's five chests down here on the floor on the left-hand side. They look a bit like pirate treasure chests, but there is something crazy cool I want to show you inside the first one. Would you give me a hand with the lid? Uh, that's got it. Thanks. Bingo, baby. Now that is what I am talking about. This chest is jam-packed full of Tutankhamun's royal jewellery and has this for a stroke of luck. The piece I want to show you is sitting right on top. It's a pendant covered with gold and silver and jewels, but the middle is the very groovy bit. Can you see? It's the shape of an ordinary old dung beetle. You know, like the one we met in our African elephant adventure. Excellent. They're also called scarab beetles. And the ancient Egyptians worshipped them because they liked the way the beetle babies came out of a ball of poo. They thought it was an excellent symbol of coming back to life. Hmm. And that's just what every good pharaoh wanted. Oh, really? There are two insanely interesting things about the body of the beetle in this pendant. Number one, it's 28 million years old. And number two, it came from outer space. 
I am not making that up. It's made from the rarest green glass in the world. Cool. It's so rare, the only place on the planet you can find it is way out in the Libyan desert. That's because 28 million years ago, a meteorite rocketed through our atmosphere and exploded into the desert sand. That explosion created temperatures hotter than the inside of a volcano. Totally melted the sand and turned it into green glass. Wow. Now that is nature doing some mind-blowing magic right there. Hang on a minute. That was one of the clues on our ticket. It said, be on the lookout for a 28 million year old insect from outer space that is believed to have magical powers. It meant this green glass scarab beetle. It was made 28 million years ago by an asteroid from outer space. And the Egyptians thought it had magical powers that could bring the pharaoh back to life. Excellent. One more clue done. OK. Time to see if we can get a bit closer to Tutankhamun himself. Or at least the mummified version of him. Now I reckon Chloe's been keeping the best for last in here. Can you see in your imagination there's a big open doorway on the wall on our right hand side. On each side of that opening is a life-size statue of a guard carrying a golden spear. It's pretty obvious that they're supposed to be guarding whatever is in that next room. But Chloe hasn't turned up the lights in there yet, so we can't see anything. Come on, let's get over there and get a closer look. I apologize, Simon. I was performing a detailed internetwork scan of the latest archaeological transcripts for this time period to refresh and maximize the accuracy of the ongoing interdimensional projection I am providing you with. Say what? I was updating and forgot to turn on the light in the other room. No worries, Chloe. We're at the doorway and ready whenever you are. Illumination in three, two, and one. Thank <laughs> you.